fascism, Marxism, religion, evolution, liberal, fundamentalist, socialist, crusader, heretic. Terms have power. Sometimes so much so that even the very mentioning of such words can evoke strong emotions on the part of the listener. But why is this? Why do such terms have such a strong emotional effect on our psyches? The short and simple answer is history. That is, it is virtually impossible to separate the meaning of a word from the historical background tied to it. And therefore, due to this historical baggage, much misunderstanding can result. Now, just to get an idea of what I'm talking about here, let's just take the example of heresy. Now, as I mentioned in one of the previous videos, generally when one uses the word heresy, images of the Inquisition and people being burned at the stake come to mind. However, as used and understood in the ancient world, Heresy could refer simply to any given party, faction, affiliation, or school of thought. It's only with the rise of Christianity that the word later takes on the more narrow and specific definition of false doctrine. That is, as opposed to the gospel truth. Or just take, for example, the terms liberal or conservative. Generally, in 21st century America at least, when we think of someone or something as being liberal or conservative, we tend to think about them in terms of specific political groups with specific aims and agendas relevant to current issues. But as probably most of us know, in the traditional sense, both of these terms, historically speaking, have a much broader range of possible meanings and therefore potentially ripe for misunderstanding and conflict to arise. Well, we're going to see this misunderstanding of terms take place in the early church as well, and so it's going to be very important to bear this in mind throughout the course of this discussion. Now, by this point, one of the main problems that was causing issues for the church was that while the terminology being used by various groups was identical, the terminology and the reality behind this terminology could often differ drastically. That is, terms such as divinity, oneness, nature, and being, while equally employed by Ebionite, Docetist, and Orthodox alike, could have quite a vast array of possible meanings all dependent on how one understood them. And so this ambiguity of meaning would often lead to much misunderstanding between Christians. And so in order for the church to make an adequate response, required a more clarified system of terminology. And therefore, in order for us to understand much of what is going on in the theological discussion of the 4th century, it will be important to examine some of the key words being thrown around. Well, when discussing the topic of the Christian God, there are a couple of terms that one needs to be familiar with. Substance and person. So to help us understand the difference between these two terms, imagine you're living in an apartment and you hear some strange, unfamiliar buzzing sound coming from the other room. In this case, generally our first question is, what is that? Simply because sounds generated by things or substances, we refer to with the word what? But then, let's say we hear a buzz at the door. In this case, we wouldn't ask, what is that? But rather, who is that? Simply because in this instance, we're not talking about something, but someone. For we use the word who when referring to a person. Now that's simple enough. The real complication comes when we factor in different languages. Well, as far as the early church was concerned, the two most dominant languages used were that of Greek and Latin. And the reason for this is that these were the two most widely spoken languages by early Christians. And therefore, in order to properly understand the theological discussion at hand, it is important that we learn the following. Now, when talking about substance in Greek, there are essentially two main terms. Ousia and hypostasis. 
and for the most part, these two are quite synonymous. However, as we shall see later in this discussion, there existed a slight distinction between them that would serve of great importance for the early church. Likewise, the Latins also had two terms to denote substance, essentia and substantia, from where we get our English equivalents essence and substance. Now, we're not going to talk much about essentia, but it's at least good to have it here. Now, substance can be a bit of a misleading term for modern minds, simply due to the influence of modern philosophy. So when we think of substance, we tend to imagine non-living inanimate matter like stone, iron, or silver. And indeed, we could apply it in this respect. However, the ancients would also use substance to refer to living things as well. In fact, they could even use it to refer to spiritual things such as angels or even divinity. Therefore, it might be better in many cases to refer to substance simply as being which in the modern sense could be applied to both living and non-living things alike. With regards to person, the Greeks used the word prosopon, the Latin equivalent of which being persona, hence from where we derive the English person. Now with these words, we have to be careful here, because prosopon, like its Latin equivalent, while in some cases could be translated accurately as person, as we understand it, in other instances, could be translated to refer to masks used by an actor in a play to represent various characters. This will be very important to bear in mind as we discuss this topic. Now, while this ambiguity and misunderstanding of terminology had always been a problem for the early church, it is really in the 4th century that we see this problem come to a head. And the place and event of this clash most prominently plays itself out at Nicaea. And it is to this council and the theology behind it that we now focus our attention. I invite all questions and comments in the discussion section, so please feel free to write or ask any questions below. Thanks.